Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello and welcome to Getting to Know You. I'm your host, Robert Jakeway. On today's program, we're going to be talking with Janet Riker, who is the director of the University Art Museum at the University at Albany. Let's go meet Janet and find out about her and the museum and the exciting exhibits that are happening there. Janet, welcome. Thank you. Nice to have you here today. And before we start talking about the museum, and the exhibitions. I'd like to give our viewers a little bit of information about you. So uh, give us your background and how you got to come to Albany. Well, I came to the University at Albany Art Museum in April 2004. Um, I came from Brooklyn, New York, where I lived with my husband and my son for um, almost 20 years. Wow. Uh, well, my son wasn't around for most of that, for some of that time, <laughs> but um, and I, where I had been at the Rotunda Gallery in Brooklyn, which is a small, um, not-for-profit exhibition space. It's a non-collecting museum, and it features the work of contemporary Brooklyn artists. So, and I think um, over that time, I saw the Brooklyn arts community develop and grow, so that. Um, what was once set up to be to showcase Brooklyn artists um, because they weren't seen in other places in the world then it later became um, a place that internationally known artists exhibited and so I think that was um, part of what made my application here to come here successful all the work I had done with contemporary artists well, obviously, you were the right person for the job, so they thought, because they did a national search, and, mm. and you're here with us now. That's true. And, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad you are. Um, we've been talking before our interview, and, mm -hmm. and one of the things that, that um, I came up with is a question, um, because it's called the University Art Museum, right. um, and I went to a current exhibition, um, and I said to myself, why is it called a museum and not a gallery, and what's mm -hmm. the difference? Well, I think the terms have become to be used interchangeably in great, great parts of the world. And so you have, um, at one point, I think maybe the definition was a, a gallery was a non um, a non collecting space, sort of like what in Europe would be called a Kunsthalle. They have changing exhibition series of changing exhibitions, but no permanent collection in that sense. Um, but and a museum was a, a, a was really sort of defined by not only its temporary exhibitions but by the strength of its permanent collection, and I think the terms are are being used interchangeably now. And you have wonderful collecting institutions like the Tate Gallery in London or the Albright Knox Gallery in in Buffalo. Right. Um, and our role is we do. We use the museum space generally for changing exhibitions, but um, the museum is designated as the caretaker for the University at Albany Art Collections, and so we do think of ourselves as a collecting institution. Well, that really helps. And, and when you talk about the University of Albany Art Collections, mm -hmm. are, they, are they housed throughout the university? Are there pieces of art throughout yes. the university? Or is there a warehouse where you're holding them? Or? No, there's, um, we actually um, install them and, and exhibit the, mo a lot of the collection in the sort of public areas on campus. So that would be in um, reception areas, conference rooms, um, public hallways, the art, the library, um, the administration building. So it's really out there um, and and doing a lot of service for us and for the viewers and people who come to visit the university. Um, it really educates people about contemporary art. Um, it serves as a show, sort of showcase of the museum and what it does. And it really enhances the environment that peop so many people live and work and study in. So we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to share it with so many thousands of people every year. 
And um, we do have exhibitions that are based on the permanent collection that are in the museum at times, you know, during the season. So, so now as director, um, mm -hmm. what is your, you know, what is your responsibility? What do you do? <laughs> Can you list oh, it, Shirley? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of everything. <laughs> um, there are just the uh, the director is responsible for the operation of the museum in in very much the broadest sense of the word. I mean, you really are responsible for um, the doors being open and the walls being clean and the artwork being professionally and beautifully hung and 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 sort of the responsibility to assure that every exhibition really showcases the artist's work to the very best extent that it can or realizes the vision of the curator in, in t completely now do you actually uh, as director do you do you think ahead and say this would be a good show uh, topic or mm -hmm. should we go into this theme kind of thing this right. is part of your response sure absolutely the long long-term planning long-range planning for the museum um, in an administrative sense in a budgetary sense um, and also in a programmatic sense and I think um, in terms of the exhibition program we try to balance that um, not over a season or a semester but really over you know several years to sort of showcase what's going on in the world of contemporary art to um, bring that wonderful rich and diverse dialogue to the capital region and to feature the very best of what's out there and and to sort of show a range of media um, a range of different approaches to the visual arts um, so I think that's sort of is definitely is part of the responsibility of the director. Now I hooked on to contemporary art. So basically the focus is to do contemporary art and how do you define contemporary yeah, art? Yeah, it really is. I mean, well, I define it as the art of our time. So um, I, I think it, and, and I think that is certainly, it's a, a wonderful, vital way to think about it. Um, so looking for new and emerging artists as well and, and, and things like that. And, and you have a program sure. at the university. I mean, it is a university. Mm -hmm. So there is a program that, that, that sort of works with the museum gallery, right? Mm -hmm. There is. I mean, I think, you know, we really we want to serve the university community and also the geographic community that we're in. Um, and we do that in a lot of different ways. And I think... Um, part of how we serve the university is, is by being part of its great mission as a research institution. Okay. Um, and I think what, in our way, what we do is provide opportunities for artists to advance their thinking um, and to do things that perhaps they couldn't do in other places, in, in other galleries or museums or commercial venues. Um, so. The show that we saw yesterday was a great example because David Updike really couldn't, um, he's represented by a, a fine gallery in New York, um, and um, but he couldn't do the kind of installation that he did on the scale that he did in, in many other venues. So I think to the extent that we can provide um, an opportunity for artists to advance the dialogue that goes on in contemporary art, um, we're really serving an important research function in, in our field. Do you actually have students who actually, do, do you have a student e e exhibition at, at some point in time? We have, we, ho we host the MFA show for the art department every year. Okay. And that really is an important connection to us, the art department. Um, we think about the art department in, in our programming. We think about um, opportunities or exhibitions that might be particularly meaningful for students. Um, um, and we think about it in terms of the diversity that we bring to the to the program. Um, so I think that that becomes another thing that sort of rolls through the brain as you look forward to the program and what it can can bring to the campus. Now I, I noticed when I was doing the research and, and looking in, in, the, in the web page um, that part of what you do also is you do education and outreach, um, and and you you it says you build partnerships. Um, uh, with a variety of, of, of other other, other uh, 
uh, things like schools and, mm -hmm. and, and educators. So uh, what does that entail? Yeah, to the extent that we can find um, connections and, and programs that we can work with other institutions um, and sometimes they're um, small partnerships like bringing students in from Albany High um, to see the exhibitions, to talk to staff about um, the exhibitions on view. Um, I think that that is meaningful and it, and it um, you know, I always think about building attendance. I always like to say that, you know, you build attendance one person at a time. So you can talk and you can think about, like, great marketing schemes and great publications that you can do. But really, um, when it comes right down to it, like getting one person in to see your exhibition and to appreciate what you do and be excited about your program, that it's amazing how that kind of viral marketing absolutely, <laughs> develops. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and I think young people are the audiences of the future. So, um, now it's a, it's a, it's an open to the public um, venue. Yes. Uh, and 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 I would imagine that people think of the university. I'm not sure how many. Uh, people think of it uh, as a place to go for mm -hmm. art, and I know that it's listed. Your, the current yes. exhibition is listed in the uh, the arts pages in the paper. Um, and I told you, I confess to you, that I've been in town for a while, yes. and I have walked by that building countless times. Yes. Um, perhaps knew that there was something in there, but never yes. happened on it. And uh, because of our chance to get together, mm -hmm. I did. And boy, was I pleased and surprised. I'm so glad. And so you're going to get a lot of good word of mouth from me <laughs> on this great. one. Uh, because That's great. Because it was a great. really a fun discovery. And, and uh, so I think one of the things we want to do today is mm -hmm. to, to encourage people to take the opportunity to come out and see um, this exhibit, right. but also others that are there. Right. So we'll talk towards the end of the program on exactly where it is and Good. how to get there and your hours of Good. operation. Um, one of the things you also do is you do programs for the public. And you have a whole series, and I was impressed on that too. So yes, this is our chance to talk about those. Good, good, good. We have um, a lecture series that we do every year. Uh, it it features um, critics, artists, writers. Um, we work in in collaboration with other entities on campus to bring speakers in. We call it the ACT program. It stands for Art and Culture Talks, and I think we work every year to bring a kind of diverse group of, of um, thinkers to campus. And this year we're having um, the artists who work in the current exhibition will both be coming up to speak. So David Updike will be coming to speak on um, March 3rd, and um, Jennifer and Kevin McCoy will be coming later on April 1st. And then in addition to that, um, we are bringing up Gregory McGuire, Who's a writer who um, wrote the, um, the book on which Wicked, the, the musical Wicked, is based? And right. he's um, a, a regional, was born and raised in Albany. And if you walk around campus, you see his face every once in a while. He's everywhere. He's our student kind <laughs> he's of thing. Everywhere. He's been very generous right. alumni. He was an alumni of the university and, um, and, and, um, and been very generous in his time and support for. Um, for the Alumni Association and for the museum as well. So Gregory's coming up, and, um, and then also uh, Roberta Smith, who's New York Times art critic for many, many years and a leading voice in, in contemporary art. Um, and the last one is Edward Winkleman, who maybe people haven't heard of as much. Ed is a gallerist in New York. He's run a gallery many years in Brooklyn and now in Chelsea. And he um, is famed for his blog, which gets some 30,000 hits a month. Wow. And Edward loves to talk about the artist's gallery relationship. Uh, he's very... Uh, He's very supportive of emerging artists and has been very open in how to approach galleries, how to um, f format your portfolio, how to sort of navigate the, um, the commercial and contemporary art scenes. So, so I think Ed will find a large audience among the arts community here. Impressive roster. And, and, uh, Thanks. Um, um, and we'll talk about the tie-in to the exhibit, uh, yeah. exhibit but um, now, are these 
you're, you're in the university, and obviously the students are, mm -hmm. are, are what you're, you're an audience you're trying to reach, but they're open to the public. Absolutely. And is there a cost for these? The lectures are free, and um, there's always parking. Uh, parking is free on the night of the lectures in Visitor Lot 1. Okay, so, and, and if you and say, I'm going to the lecture, then they'll know. They'll know. You absolutely <laughs> need to say you're going <laughs> to the lecture. That. And um, times and start dates and locations, because some of them are not on, in the museum, but others are, are all on our website. Okay, so. great. And we'll show the website so people can go there, and, and I really encourage them to do that. All right, now we're going to talk about the current um, exhibition. Sure. And, and, um, and the tie-in with the, with the, uh, the series also, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the current exhibition um, opened recently, and it's going to run through uh, the beginning of April. Is April that correct? April 6th, yes. Okay. And what is, the, what is it called? What's the exhibition called? Well, we think of it as two exhibitions. Uh, the exhibition on the ground floor is the work of Jennifer and Kevin McCoy, uh, a married couple who have worked uh, together for their entire artistic careers, and it's called The Allure of the Literal. Okay. And then on the upper level of the museum, the exhibition is by uh, an artist named David Updike, and his is called Plan C. Okay. There were times during the installation where I wondered whether Plan C <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and we, I think kind of when we take our tour, I think people will understand what it you're just was saying. It's quite challenging. And the nice thing is, I mean, you come in to, to one, one artist's work, um, and then you actually transition through the, by way of staircase yes. to the second level to the, uh, to the other artist's work. Yes. And, and uh, how, did you, how did you come about having these people do this particular exhibition? Well, you've hit on one sort of aspect that's an important consideration. I've known, I mean, as, as a person in this field, you know and you follow the work of artists who are of interest to you uh, over a period of years. I had the opportunity to show these artists uh, when I was in Brooklyn at the Rotunda Gallery in, in group shows, uh, which were so that each of them would have like one piece or two pieces in that group show. But this presented the opportunity to show their work in depth, in much, much greater depth. Um, and the other thing that was important in, in working in, that, in the particular space that we're in at the University Art Museum is that just as you say, when you walk in the space, the entire facility is basically visible to you. Right. So that when one selects or invites an artist, um, to occupy part of the space, you need to find an, another artist or another show that will be um, have have a compatibility that will will where there's sort of a meaningful dialogue among the artist's works. So I think that you can, although we talked about the exhibition very uh, two separately, right. I like to think about. This, that there are like these meaningful threads that run through both of them that that um, people can sort of see and absorb, and I think they they the work there are great similarities among Jennifer and Kevin and David's work, and yet they're very very different. Distinctly different, right? Yes. Right. Now, as far as Jennifer and Kevin, um, is it unusual to have a husband and wife uh, team? It's very unusual. Um, I. I, there, are very, They're unusual. <laughs> there are very few people in life and art who can succeed at having um, a viable husband and wife team that work together and live together and, and, make, and make their future together. Um, and I think they, they think of themselves in a way as kind of um, sort of unusual in that regard that the work is very much a team effort. There's, it's not broken down that one person does one thing and another does the other. It really is a composite of their unique vision as a couple. I, and when, when we take our tour uh, of the exhibit, and, and uh, I want to make sure that people understand that even though we're, we're, we're touring a lot of the, and seeing a lot of the works there, that it, it does not replace the, the, the need to actually go and see them in, in live. In oh, person absolutely. Because, um, it really is quite an experience. And I'm imagining as, as we look at, at, at Jennifer and Kevin's work, um, them putting it together. 
and uh -huh. you know, uh, not only the concept, but right. actually the, 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 the where things go and how things work together. Right. Uh, that would be fun to sort of observe. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> take a sneak peek. Now, as far as David goes, um, uh, he's, a, he's a local person. He grew up in this area, right? Yes, he grew up in Niskayuna. All right, and, 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 and he was, and, and you'll see in his work that there is a, a, um, there is a difference, um, mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a lot of precision in what he does here. Um, and so he left the area and, and, and uh, um, obviously has been showing his work and doing work in a lot of uh, interesting venues. Um, so um, let's take ourselves to the museum. Okay. And we're going to take a tour. We're going to start with Jennifer and Kevin's work first uh, and talk about specific pieces. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to transition to David's work. Okay. And then we'll come back to the studio. Great. Okay. Well, Janet, here we are in the museum gallery and we're on the first floor. And this is where you're exhibiting the works of Jennifer and Kevin McCoy, who we've talked mm -hmm. about. And I thought we'd start with this very interesting piece um, and have you describe it so our viewers sure. can get an idea of what's going on here. Now, this piece is called Every Anvil. So what does that mean? Um, well, what you see when you look at Every Anvil is a compilation of different clips that have been extracted from Looney Tunes cartoons. And so the name of the piece is called Every Anvil, but actually what it documents is every one of a, a very many number of circumstances. So every anvil is every anvil dropping on a character. Every hunting is every episode of hunting that is compiled as that is clipped out, edited, and compiled on these DVDs. And other ones we have are every cloud of smoke, every visualized sound, every explosion, every slamming, every sneaking, and every panic. So there are, I think there are about 60 of them that really sort of, what they do is really deconstruct um, a medium that we're looking at usually looking at for narrative content. We're usually looking for a story. And what the McCoys have done is sort of turned it into a digital database okay. where they've sort of taken a category and extracted just that material out of many cartoons and then sort of put them all together for us. But it's a bit of a nostalgia piece too for us who've watched these cartoons over the years. I mean, we can go up there and say, oh yes, I remember, or wait, you know, do they have this particular one? And for the purpose of the exhibit, you're changing basically the every whatever each day, that's right? That's right. That's okay. right. We are, so that people can get to see many of them. And I think one of the things that's fascinating about this piece is it was one of the first pieces that the McCoys did. And so it really sort of um, is a, an ex and, and yet there are themes from every anvil, as we see, that continue through their work. So, and I think a student said it to me best when they said that, that what the McCoys do, it's a different way of looking at material. So it's a very different way and, and sort of be careful what you think you see and what you are looking at. Now this is in a private collection right now. This it is. is. This is not it part is of in New York. Okay. And is there any you know, relevance? What is the relevance to the, the, the way it's, it's, it's framed or whatever? Is there anything particular? Well, that's, a good that's a good question. I mean, I think of it as sort of a portable kind of, I, I mean, I love the idea that you can fold this up and you can take it anywhere and you can enjoy seeing it. I mean, it's a really attractive visual display and that idea that you could have this with you everywhere and anywhere and get your fix of, say, <laughs> you know, every ailment, whatever you want, is just a wonderful, playful thing. And and I think that playful quality sort of pervades a lot of the McCoy's work, so. Well, let's go look at some of their other work. Absolutely. All right, Janet, now we've moved to another piece that they've done, and this looks stationary as it mm -hmm. is, and it has all these sort of tendrils around it, but let's, let's, what is the name of this work, and what's happening here? Okay, this piece is called Double Fantasy, and the tendrils are actually, some of them are lights, and others are tiny little cameras. So they're tiny little video cameras, and what the video cameras are, um, 
seeing is being projected on the wall behind us. And the reason that it's called Double Fantasy is Kevin and Jennifer have an interesting art practice. They work as a couple. They're a married couple and their work has always been as a team. And what this piece does is it, it, it takes their fantasies as children of what their careers would be in the future and it kind of merges them. So they've created these tiny little models and stage sets of what they sort of imagine that they might be in the future. So for Jennifer, down here we have Jennifer being a school teacher and so we have tiny little desks and students behind them. And in a little larger and grander uh, fantasy, um, Jennifer has imagined herself as being an ambassador's wife and you can see her coming down the grand staircase, grand staircase yeah. and at a banquet and um, Kevin's fantasies um, pertain to science and so Kevin has on the reverse of this panel Kevin has imagined himself as a scientist working in a secret laboratory and so and so there are tiny little models and they kind of look like the artists if you look very close and so that's sort of the kernel of double fantasy. And when you, because it's projected behind yes. us on a screen. Now, is this a random order, or is there is there a set order to it? Actually, there there's a set order, and they're quite precise about the angles of the cameras, and then the um, and then the order of the the sequencing is digitally mixed inside the piece. Must be a fascinating piece for people who are you know are gathered around it and kind of trying to figure <laughs> out what's going on exactly. and looking from underneath and saying oh yeah trying to match it exactly and, uh, um, exactly wonderful wonderful because the use of, of camera and a still piece giving it maybe some sense of motion and and yet um, it's wonderful yes so. and I like the idea of sort of this concept of memory being this sort of um, elastic thing and it's almost like the Looney Tunes cartoons that they've sort of edited out some of their memories and their 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 memory of what they fantasized when they were children and so and it's sort of that way that you can kind of embellish on a memory or or like reconstruct a fantasy so there's an interesting sort of parallel with they, a lot of the other work that they, must they have do. They a great time doing this. They, they do. <laughs> they, it seems to me they have a great time doing a lot of their work. It surely shows. Okay, let's go look at something entirely different. Great. Okay? All right, Janet, we've taken a, a bit of a departure, and, and we're actually doing looking at a first for these uh, from these artists. And it, I'm going to start by saying this: when you come upon it, it's something that sort of registers in your mind as something familiar, uh, <laughs> which is which is what it is. Um, but let's talk about actually what it is and what is it called. Mm -hmm. They're called princess paintings and we have princess painting light and on the, uh, adjacent to it we have princess painting dark. And I think that's a perfect capsulation of looking at something that's familiar, that's vaguely familiar, that you're trying very hard in your mind to kind of pull it all together and in a way like as if they're every anvil piece takes things apart. I think the mind is trying to pull this together and figure out what it is. But you're right, because if you look closely, there's lots of little digital quotes from Cinderella. Okay. There's um, the Grand Stairway and the Castle Turret, the Castle Pennant. Um, and we see in the other painting, there are sort of um, see Cinderella's arms, her hairdo, her face in a kind of disembodied form. And as I said when I first saw it, bibbity bobbity boo. Absolutely. <laughs> Every bit of that. There's a lot of magic about it. It is. So actually, how is this painting done? Uh, Jennifer and Kevin designed the paintings and conceived of the idea, designed the paintings, and created a digital file. And then that digital file was projected onto aluminum. And two students who volunteered from our MFA program in the art department, and they actually executed the paintings right here where we stand, basically. And, and this is on, this is, what is it painted on? It's painted on a, an aluminum uh, plate. Okay. Right. Okay. And it's an enamel paint? Yes. 
But it's very interesting. It's, we talked about the deconstruction before. This is clearly deconstructing, mm -hmm. and, and yet our mind is working at trying to, to put it always, together. Always, always. And I think what's sort of interesting is it's sort of there's a, there's a, a question of the, the mind and the eye, because when you step farther away from these paintings, I think you don't really notice that all of the, all of the edges here are kind of pixelated. Yes, they so are. it kind of reminds you that this is a digital medium and that, you know, what you can Conceive of as this whole blown wonderful imaginary world is really just these tiny little fragments of, of image that are, have been put together in this way. So. I think it's wonderful. Now, since we talked about light, let's go look at dark. A sure. Bit. Okay, here we are on the dark side. Absolutely. And as with the other one, you can certainly see, like you said before, there, there are fragments there that sort of compel us to, to put it all together. Um, and um, you know, as a, as a companion, as a pair, it's really fun because uh, right. I think this one, to me anyway, was the one that I could sort of identify more clearly uh -huh. um, because I think it has more, to me, tangible pieces of, of, of an object right. than that one, even though it has a staircase and stuff, but uh, uh, nonetheless fun. And, and since you mentioned the, the pixelation and whatever have you, it becomes even more interesting to look at. Okay, well, let's, let's move on to another one of sort of similar to what they've done before, but obviously different. So let's go. Great. Okay. All right, now we've, we've come back to something a little bit like the others, but, but different. And it does have movement. And it's using the cameras as well. And it's called Big Box. And um, as we see projected on the screen here, we're getting very familiar names of the, the, the Big Box stores. Mm -hmm. And yet, what else is taking place in this particular piece? Well, Jennifer and Kevin have created a sort of moving tableau of storefronts. And then in between those storefronts, we have sort of a, a, a location that sometimes is part jungle. I think I saw some little monkeys in there and vines, <laughs> but then also part like dumpster and trash heap. And so I think they're sort of alluding to, you know, what goes on behind the facade. And um, I, in selecting work for the exhibition, I really couldn't resist this particular piece because the location of the museum is right next to Crossgates Mall and, yes. and so many big boxes and stores, so the names are all very familiar. And, um, and I think I told you before at one point, Robert, that at one point I had driven behind some of these mall stores and it doesn't look too different. I was going to say, this. they're kind of bringing them both together here. I brought the monkey, by the way. Exactly. Interesting, interesting piece a lot of fun. Now, how, what kind of comments when people see this? Are they just sort of, um, you know, gravitating towards the familiar and or are they trying to pick out pieces as, as it rolls by or bits and pieces of it? And I think people are always trying to match the image of what they see and physically the object with the with the video image. And I think that's sort of, and then also I think in a way there people are kind of bringing to it what they know. They so, it's, so it's like my remembering a trip behind the mall stores at, at Crossgates. It's like people, you know, are bringing that as well. Perhaps so. we'll never look at these stores the same way again. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to what I think is really a wonderfully fascinating piece. So let's move. Great. All right, Janet, we're at, at this piece here that, that is stationary and mm -hmm. yet it moves. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's a familiar object. Right. Um, I don't think it would take too long to figure out what it is. And it's called High Seas, Correct. right? Correct. Okay, and just what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is we have a wonderful model of the Titanic, and we have a moving light and a tiny little camera, as we've seen before um, in their work, and that's moving along a wave track that completely surrounds the model of the Titanic. And what the camera is seeing is being projected onto the wall behind us. So I think of it as another example of what the students said to me is that what you you see with the McCoys is not always the reality. So while we can look at a very peaceful stationary model of the Titanic, when we turn around and see it projected on the wall, it has sort of the feel of a, an old time documentary, maybe a contemporary documentary done of the ship. And it's obviously rocking and roiling and in the throes of, of, of imminent disaster. 
But I think what happens when you look closer is sometimes you actually begin to see part of the museum in the background, uh -huh. or we can even, you'll even see yourself at some part, points along the way. And so it really is this kind of disconnect between what's happening and, again, what, what it is, what you see, and all the details that your mind sort of fills in. I know, and, and I was just, as you were talking, I'm noticing that we really are moving forward. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's really, it's somewhat disconcerting, and it's fun. And it, now, did they actually did the whole model? They didn't build the model. They, they had the model, they, they ordered the model, and they had the model constructed from a, um, a model-making company in Brooklyn. Originally, the concept of the piece was for an exhibition at Phillips Andover, at the Academy in Massachusetts. And they had asked Jennifer and, Co and Kevin to make a piece using an object from their collection. So the original piece had a large three-masted schooner, a model of a schooner ship, in, in the center where the Titanic sits. So when, after the exhibition, so they conceived the entire piece and the framework and the camera and lights. So when they came back, obviously the model stayed at Phillips and they came back with the framework and began to sit around thinking of, you know, what would be another kind of iconic ship that would have the sort of mystery and majesty of the, the schooner model that they had used and the idea sort of came to them, the Titanic. And so that's sort of the evolution of high seas. It's wonderful because, you know, as you look at it, it's a very detailed, very fine Absolutely. replica. And when you see it projected, you also, and I think you mentioned a little bit of this before, you start to, I did anyway, uh -huh. imagine things or people inside or, or, or whatever. I start seeing things that perhaps aren't there, but are they? Right, exactly. <laughs> what, a, what a fun exactly. piece. Exactly. Wow, very good. All right, now we're gonna go and we're gonna go upstairs and we're gonna change artists. Great. So let's do that. All right, Janet, we mounted the staircase yeah. and we not only changed floors, but we changed artists. And up here is, is artwork by David Opdyke. Correct. Right? Um, and it takes on a whole different form from what we have downstairs. And one of the fascinating things that happens and a beautiful thing about this whole exhibit is as you walk the staircase, you, you realize, I mean, you've realized it when you can't come in also, that there's something looming overhead. <laughs> That's right. And if you look at it closely, you see paper airplanes strung together. But it really is a lot more. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think we have about 2,000 paper airplanes. Um, many, many of them were uh, folded by our work-study students here at the University at <laughs> Albany. And they were enormously helpful. They did that last semester. And David came up for a week. He had designed the piece. Um, and they came up, and um, it was strung here um, over about four days' time. And so the piece is called Mixed Messages. And really, I like to think about it as a giant metaphor for the situation in the Middle East. Um, mixed Messages, uh, the paper airplanes, when you look at them closely, you discover that they are folded out of Arab, English, English Arab dictionary pages. Um, and um, they in their configuration in the space, they actually spell out words. And the words that they spell out are words used to describe the situation in the Middle East, but from very different perspectives. Okay. So um, on, you can see these two dissecting strands of airplanes. And on one strand, we have words like rogue state, sleeper cells, counterinsurgency and war on terrorism. And on the other, we have oil corporation coalition, pr profit, illegal occupation, and neo-colonialist crusaders. So I think what David's saying in this piece is that we're, people are looking at the situation in the Middle East, and they're using words to describe the situation as they see it. But, um, those words in and of themselves have a power and a definition to their particular point of view. And why I say the piece is a giant metaphor is that the words are never really legible all from one place. That's right. 
So, and then, so you really have to move around the piece and look at it from different perspectives to really be able to read the words. And you'll never see all of them at once. Because well, there's, there's a convergence. I mean, it happens so that things just meld together. And so you might start something and then have it sort of dissipate. Exactly. And so I think in a way where that area of convergence, that area of conflict, there's actually no legibility. There's no ability to decipher what the discussion is or to use words to define, to use any words to define the situation. And the fact that David sort of constructed this out of airplanes, you know, a vehicle for combat and for destruction makes it ever, even more poetic in a way. Well, we're going to take some more shots and try to get so people can get an idea of, of how, I mean, it's a very big piece. It is. Um, it's something I think you could spend a lot of time at from various perspectives yes. trying to figure out exactly. You can make a word out clearly and see where it might go and take you. And it certainly is uh, worthy of a lot of conversation. And you mentioned the, the airplane. Mm -hmm. And in, in other pieces uh, that David has done here, um, he's used helicopters or right. flight uh, images as well. Yes. So uh, yes. let's go take a look at a couple of those. Sure. All right, Janet, we've just finished talking about David's, David's uh, wonderful piece in the middle here. And now we're going to, to works that are on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said when I first saw these, there's sort of a, a feeling of a graphic novel, not to take away from the artist, mm -hmm. but there's a, uh, it's pen, it's right. ink, on paper, and it's, it's a lot of precision and detail in this work. Uh, and this particular one is called Achievements. And right. what is it saying? Well, I think um, it's, a, it's another one of the threads that runs through David's work. I mean, he's very interested in the military industrial complex. And I think you see that in the mixed messages pieces and the current political situations. And then another thread that runs through his work is about sort of um, the commodities and, and our, our sort of acquisitiveness and the significance that objects and acquiring those objects take in our life. So this piece is called Achievements and when you look very closely it literally is a stack of objects that run the gamut from you know pickup trucks and swimming pools and campers and, and um, and sailboats and to like very minor little things like you know potted plants and and lamps and light bulbs and bedsteads and and I think what he's saying is that that you know that's really perhaps not the best way to measure achievement in life by how many things and how many objects you collect or gain on your passage through it all it is, it turns into a pile. I mean, exactly. And it, it, it's, it's interesting perspective-wise, because if you, if you were to see this from a, a fair distance, mm -hmm. you wouldn't see the detail. You'd see right. something that would tell you maybe mountain or pinnacle or whatever have you in this kind of right. landscape thing. And then as you come up to it, you start getting right. uh, more of the richness of the detail. And it gets more and more grotesque. Yes, grotesque is right. Yeah. Yes. Well, let's move on to another one that caught my eye when we first saw it. In the last piece, we talked about commodities and acquiring them. And now we're going to be looking at something in three different panels about the, the means to get those Absolutely. commodities. And it's called Fiduciary Remains 1, 2, and 3. Right. And I thought this was a fascinating picture. Sort of sort of looks like a part when you go there, sort of like a, a scene from uh, a ruin, like a, an Aztec ruin or something. But Absolutely. Upon closer inspection, it's actually uh, imagery that's taken from a $1 bill. And so you've got some of the, um, the leaves and berries that surround the, the bill, and then also the, the, um, the uh, typography of, from the bill that says one. And it's sort of written, it's sort of, um, they take a sculptural form on top of this pedestal, but they've somehow been eroded by plants and vines, and they're sort of in a crumbling state, which it sort of maybe becomes a little uncomfortable given like the current state of the economy. <laughs> the current value of our dollar. <laughs> the value of the dollar. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that David was thinking certainly of the value of the dollar <laughs> when he did these pieces because they were very recent. They were done last year, late last year. So um, it is a fascinating piece. And it brings up this other sort of topic that, that has a lot of uh, currency 
excuse the pun, in David's work, and that, that is of sort of a dystopia, like this future that's not bright, that is gray and gloomy and, and sort of on the, on the pessimistic, on the dark side of, of, of science fiction. So. What wonderful work, and however, however small it may appear, you can really get fascinated for quite a while looking at the, the various component parts. So. Absolutely. Now we're going to look at one more p artwork, Great. and then we're going to look at a model, and and we really want to encourage people to come to the gallery. Oh, absolutely. We don't want to show everybody everything that's here, <laughs> uh, even though I'd like to talk about it. So let's uh, move on to the other piece of art Great. on the wall, and then we'll go look at the models. Great. All right, this work is called Aeronautical Manifestation. Okay, is that right? Yep. And we had also talked about a an interesting connection between the the suspended work in 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 the foyer there and and the artwork as well as, as we talked you talked about the strings um, so what do we have depicted here well we have um, helicopters that are actually and from the helicopters uh, that are strings or wires or cords that connect to the bald eagles that are flying below so it's very ambiguous as to whether the helicopters are supporting the eagles or the eagles are flying along and the helicopters are supporting them. But I think it's, it, again, he's trying to make this connection between the military establishment and symbols of America. And as you can see in like the, the $1 bill, I mean, these, these images of the eagle, the planes, the helicopters, they all have resonance as symbols of this country. And so I think that's sort of what the play he's making now. You know, and as I look at it this time, I, I almost, I saw the, the, the eagles as, as being, in effect, puppets. Uh-huh. Um, and having them being uh, manipulated. So, right. you know, the war has manipulated the, uh, Absolutely. wow. Absolutely. That's a great reading. Absolutely. Nice. Nice. Now, we're going to go to something that's three-dimensional. Yep. And very vivid, and, and I guess also depicts a lot of what David, how David started in the career, am I right? That's true. David started as a an, an, um, model maker for an architectural firm. And I think that a lot of um, a lot of that shows is very obvious in his work. And you know, his interest in draftsmanship also, I think, um, is, is very obvious. And his father was here and told the story that uh, since he could hold a pencil, he's been drawing. So he's really one of those people who's been drawing for his whole life. And, and a bit more about David. I don't know, he's not a boy, he's a man, but he's a local, he's local. Yes, he um, was born and grew up in Niskayuna, so. Nice, yeah. nice. Okay, let's go look at this other work. Here we have a very large model, actually. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it certainly looks like it's been very intricately put together, but it's very much like the, the works that are on, on the, uh, on the, the, uh, the paper. Uh, and what is this one called? It's called Zenith. And I think here we have, we pick up the strand of, um, of David's um, view of dystopia. It's a grim view of the future. Um, it's sort of moss, this moss-covered structure, a lot of which he's carved out of foam core and okay. painted, okay. Um, and some of uh, which is traditional sort of model-making material, and you can recognize some of those forms of just pipes and, and, um, and constructions. And I think it's, um, it's a sort of, um, it's a grim view of the future. We don't know exactly what's what it is or what it's for or what it's if it's making something or holding something there are tiny little figures I see them. in it there are actually a couple of deer and um and there's the very smallest little campsite that's really up at the top of one of these pinnacles and is this the one where you mentioned the red string that was yes uh, that's that red string that's sort of um piled up at the bottom there actually goes right from the campsite. So I guess we'd have to conclude that somebody um, climbed that rope or climbed down from that campsite. And one campsite. more connected. Exactly, exactly. And I was noticing that there are a lot of little strings and vines on the piece. So that seems to be sort of a, 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 a thread that runs through his work. <laughs> that, <laughs> there you oh. go again. And, and really, another piece of work that you can spend um, a lot of time looking at and trying to, to piece it together and maybe get, you get one idea of what it is and all of a sudden it sort of changes. And um, it's just, it's, it's large and it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. 
And yeah. it sort of absorbs whatever narrative you'd like to exactly. imagine. Exactly. Very futuristic and yet, you know. So let's look at the last model here okay. uh, before we go back to the uh, studio. One of the nice things about these two pieces is that they're, they're separated from the, the rest of the, of the work. So you really have a chance to come in here and sort of do your inspection and to Absolutely. contemplate and to muse over them. And this one is very much like a, um, um, a spaceship or something that has just uh, landed or fallen apart. What is it called? It's called Nadir. Okay. And once again, we have all this kind of uh, fusing together of, of uh, some familiar objects and, and uh, ladders and, and pipes. And uh, I see that there's a, a, a sea or a water anyways in a, in a boat down yes. here. Um, and one of the wonderful things is when you look at it, uh, from the top here, you see this kind of um, um, almost evolution of things I'm seeing, things that are coming out of the ground or that have been embedded in it. And uh, mm -hmm. um, here I'm doing all the talking. <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. <laughs> you're doing a great job. I think it definitely is something that's sort of crashed to earth or fallen from a great height and embedded itself in this precarious way. And there seems to be a cruise ship that's coming out to look at look it or at it. meander around it as if it's some sort of um, um, you know, our uh, landmark or, or tourist uh, event. And um, I think it continues the same sort of post-apocalyptic vision of, of Zenith, the other piece we just looked exactly. at. It's a world that we don't really know much about, but he's given us kind of the evidence and things that look vaguely familiar, but in a sort of unsettling way. It's, it's um, it's, it's not a future that's welcoming or positive or, or um, holds out great promise for yet, us as knows? a species. People are going to make money off of the tour ship. That's true. <laughs> there, there may be people on that ship that are, uh, that this may be somewhere in some distant place. We, we've sort of seen this object or like this uh, floating about in space in a variety of different space features and all of a yeah. sudden it's, it's bingo. It's here and, and it's among us. and, and uh, you look at it with awe and kind of wonderment, and, and uh, mm -hmm. it's also kind of fearful as well. As Absolutely, well. I think it's all of those things. Well, Janet, we 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 finished going through the gallery, and as I said before, we're not going to um, show all the works because we really want to get people here, and we're going to talk Great. about where the gallery is, where the museum is, and how to get here. Uh, but I want to thank you for the tour here, and we're going to go back to the studio now. A pleasure. Terrific. Okay, look forward to it. Okay, that was absolutely wonderful. Um, and you know, I mean, that was my second visit, and, and <laughs> I, uh, I told you before that I was a, a convert, and, and uh, um, my colleague Richard went with us in, to do the filming, and he also was quite impressed by it. And I'm, I really want to underscore that this is an exhibit not to be missed, and I encourage people to go see it. Um, it's fun. It, mm -hmm. it provokes thought. Absolutely. Um, so it, true. it creates all sorts of feelings. Um, and just to experience the space, I think, is really important. So yes. um, um, I, really, I really hope that people can do that as a result of watching this program. And I thank you for, for guiding us through all this stuff. Um, now, people will want to know exactly, they know where the university is, but mm -hmm. how do you get to the museum? Um, the museum, the, the, um, they know where the university is. We're starting from that. We're, we're hoping they do anyway. <laughs> there, the easiest way to think about the university is that there's a perimeter road that runs around the outside of the university, which spans um, Washington, from Washington to Western Avenue. Right. Um, and along the perimeter road, there are signs that will direct you to visitor lot one. Okay. And that really is the best, the best and the closest lot, to, visitor lot to the museum. Okay, so that's the thing to remember, and visitor part, lot one. Yes, and, and visitors to the campus do need to park in the parking in the visitor lot. Right, because if you went in the wrong space, obviously you do have a long walk as well as get confused as where, where, well, where right, everything is. Well, right, and a lot of the parking is by permit only. So. Now, once they get out uh, uh, in, of their of their vehicle in the lot, um, what mm -hmm. direction should they go in? I mean, is, is, there, is there a sign there that tells them that the art gallery is this way or the museum is this way or not really? Um, not really. Right now, we're under a lot of construction yeah. at that ent that entryway, that entry plaza. I'm sure you re you, you yes, saw that I did. yesterday. No, I, I went the wrong way the other day. 
<laughs> so I guess the easiest way um, to think about it is there the um, the in, the university um, is what we call the podium at the university is that raised large rate platform on which many of the buildings sit. So if the visitor goes and walks to, toward that platform and up the steps, they will see the museum on their left. And there are banners that say University Art Museum, so right. you can recognize We're that. Not and the doors are right the there. One too. Yes, absolutely. Now, hours of operation. Museum hours are Tuesday through Friday, 10 to 5, and Saturday and Sunday from noon until 4. Okay. And parking is free on the weekends. Terrific. And, and as I, we've said before, if people want to explore this a bit more before they go, they can go on to the, uh, the web page, yes. um, which is www.albany.edu slash museum. Correct. Okay. And find out all sorts of good stuff about this. And, um, and underscore again, it's free of charge. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is absolutely worth the visit. Um, we're about ready to wind up the show, um, um, but is there anything you'd like to say before we do? Um, no, I think we've sort of said it all, and I think the important thing is to make sure that people come to the museum and experience the show, because I think that is the really wonderful thing about the visual arts, is that it really, I, I, I always sort of think of it as one person talking to another. and and you've kind of got to be there to sort of experience it and engage in that conversation. And so we're always delighted to have people come to the museum. Well, thanks again, Janet, for being a guest on the show. Uh, it was delightful meeting you and really delightful talking with you. And I hope we can chat again in it the near future. It was my pleasure, Rob. Thank you so much. Thanks. And thank you for joining me on Getting to Know You. I hope you enjoyed today's program. As you can tell, I did. And we'll see you again next time. Until then, have a good one. Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel.